it's my pleasure to introduce our congressman to you, Mr. Mike Kaufman. It's so great to see the, the military honored uh, uh, here today. We, we just had a hearing in the Armed Services Committee that I sit on uh, with the United States Army, with the, the Secretary and the Chief of Staff uh, of the Army. And, they, and essentially, 75% of young people, the, the military is so elite today that, that for the United States Army, 75% of young people today are ineligible uh, for military service, that they can't test high enough. Physically, they, they can't do it. They, they've got some, uh, you know, criminal altercation, but 75% are deemed ineligible. And uh, when I look back and I enlisted in the Army, I would have been part of that 75%. Um, but uh, I, um, uh, you know, my father had been a great soldier. At the end of the junior year of high school, uh, I went to see my father. I said, you know, uh, who had misrepresented his age and enlisted in the United States Army during World War II, so I reminded him of that and uh, was able to get him to sign for me and uh, joined after my junior year and, and, and earned a high school diploma in the United States Army and then went on to the University of Colorado in the Army Reserve. But I remember going back to see my father uh, to tell him that I decided to transfer to the Marine Corps. And he'd think that I was uh, joining some kind of satanic cult. And, and my father just went nuts. He goes, Marines, they're nothing but animals. And uh, all they have is infantry. And uh, just to go back, um, uh, with my father, I, I, um, he told me uh, when I saw him about going to the Army, he said, you need to enlist for three years and not for two, because if you're going for um, three, you can get a guarantee and go to a technical school and make something for yourself. If you're going for two years, the Army's going to choose what you're going to do, and you're going to be in the United States Army Infantry. And my father was in the Army Infantry for the first 10 years, wounded in combat, uh, was in the Medical Corps for his last half of his career. And I said, no, Dad, I talked to the recruiter, and he said I could go in for two years and I wouldn't serve in the Army Infantry, and I, I spent the next two years in the Army Infantry. And, and then when I saw my father uh, about the Marine Corps, I had the, the officer's brochure and the gloss brochure, and I said, I said uh, when my father says, oh, they have this infantry, I said, no, they have aviation, intelligence, supply, logistics, and went down all that stuff, and then I became an infantry officer in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, but uh, um, sometimes, uh, we, you know, we, um, I, I have to apologize that um, sometimes emotions run high. Now we're talking about all the civility stuff uh, in Washington. And, and I had said something that maybe I should not have said uh, on the House floor last year in response to what the Democrats were doing in their spending. And I said that, that, um, that, that you know, what they were doing, that, that, that you know, Democrats were spending money like, like drunken sailors. And... Uh, you know, I tell you what, I, I and mean, that was that long, and, and it really was. And I, and I think in the environment of civility, I, I like to apologize to every member of the United States Navy who's ever been caught drunk uh, on shore duty. And, and the reason is because and I've seen when I was in the Marine Corps, I saw many of them come back in pre-dawn hours, staggering back to the ship. But I can tell you that their responsibility, their their conduct, is far more responsible than what I've seen in the conduct of the United. In the Congress of the United States over the last two years, uh, when those sailors, uh, let me tell you, when those sailors uh, ran out of spending their own money, they sobered up. And I can't say the same about the Democrat-controlled Congress. But I mean, if you think about it, how extraordinary is it that in um, that my first year in 2009, um, they they spent 3.5 trillion dollars when we only took in $2.2 trillion, $1.3 trillion deficit. Uh, last year, um, well, then, um, uh, let's go to the President's budget. And the President's budget actually makes it worse. $1.6 trillion deficit. Um, he wants to spend $3.8 trillion when we're only projected to take in $2.2 trillion. There's no way that this country can be sustained by doing that. And uh, when, in, when the Democrats took control of Congress in January 2007, the national debt stood at $8.6 trillion. In January, when we took over the House from the Democrats, 
The national debt stood at $14 trillion in that span of time. And so there are no easy decisions at this point. And I remember a reporter calling me up about a week ago and said, well, what about this cut and this cut and this cut and this cut? And I told him, I said, you know what, the choice is this. The choice is we can either allow the Congress of the United States to bankrupt this country, or we can make the tough decisions now. Those are, the, that, those are the choices that we have to make, and there's no easy choices. But let me just say this. I recently came to your county and, and met with your, your, your county uh, c commissioners, uh, uh, Kurt Slagle, Del Swan, and John Schiff, and, and they told me about what they were doing to balance their budget. And I can tell you they're making some tough decisions, but they're making the right decisions. And, and then I was supposed to present a flag to them that had flown over the capital of the United States. Uh, during in the county commissioner's uh, uh, meeting. And, and I said to him, I said, you know what? I shouldn't be presenting you a flag for, that had flown over, flown over the Capitol uh, as a member of Congress to Elbert County commissioners. What you ought to be doing is coming to Washington, D.C. and presenting the Elbert County flag to the Congress of the United States because let me tell you, Washington doesn't have anything to teach you, but you have a lot to teach Washington, D.C. I think the three big issues that uh, uh, respected to my committees uh, uh, on armed services, let me tell you this, that like any bureaucracy, there's waste. And, and somebody with a military background that could be that fiscal hawk, uh, we need it and I'm doing it. And I just had a, a fight with the Navy where they wanted to take two ships and retire them before the end of their service life to save on operating costs. And I said, you know, your job, your mission, is to project sea power. And you've got as many admirals today in the United States Navy as you've got ships. And I said, I can tell you where to make the cuts. I go over the Pentagon. And so they put those two ships back in the service. The, um, uh, on natural resources. Um, I just took on Ken Salazar and committee. Good. And I said, it's time for you to let America develop America's natural resources. Yeah. This is the second time, the second time he's been asleep on his watch. The first time, the failure to regulate uh, golf, um, oil production in the Gulf. This responsibility. And we had that tragedy. This time, he's throwing up every, every block that he can every impediment that they can to allow us to develop our oil and natural gas on public lands. And i got to tell you, energy prices are coming up. I've had four assignments in the Middle East. I understand the instability of that region. And I'll tell you what, the tolerance for this economy, as fragile as this recovery is, to take a prolonged energy shock, uh, what it will do is we'll put this country uh, back in a, in a double dip recession. And all of our, our, our gains will be lost. And so uh, I'm putting forward legislation uh, that will open up public lands uh, responsibly for oil and gas development in this country. I'm sure I'm have a, a, a subcommittee and a small business uh, committee on oversight and investigations. And I want to tell you, uh, I'm going to look at every program uh, do away with those that, that aren't creating jobs and, and keep those that are. I do believe, though, uh, that it is a time in America where race-based and gender-based preferences ought to be over with. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just say that close with this. And that, um, you know, I have some disagreements uh, in Iraq. I mean, in Afghanistan now with uh, the nation building stuff, but I believe we got security interests there. And let me tell you, uh, our uh, young men and women over there are doing an incredible job. But they're paying a heavy price. And uh, I had a Marine a couple months ago who was seriously wounded there, uh, what they call a bilateral amputation above the knees. And it is a new signature wound in Afghanistan. Uh, we've uparmed our vehicles, and it takes the, the, the Taliban a half ton of explosives to be able to blow up one of our, our um, 
or MRAPs, Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicles. They take, they're too exposed, too long, too dangerous for them to do, so they've shifted their tactics. And their tactics now are, instead of doing those large explosives, they're breaking it down to very small anti-personnel IEDs. And uh, with very little metallic signature. And, uh, and so, um, uh, I went to see Lance Corporal Riley um, for a few times, and then uh, the, the Navy uh, contacted me or went to the medical of Bethesda and said, would you visit all of the Marines there that are there? And then the Army said, well, Matthew, you're there, why don't you go to Walter Reed too and, and visit the wounded? And I'll tell you how tough it was that uh, uh, I finally said, you know, I said, tell me what the injury is before I go in the room. And in every instance, almost bilateral amputation above the knees. But let me tell you this, that, that those soldiers and Marines, uh, and, and some uh, uh, sailors, that, um, that their attitude was such that they wanted to be back in the fight. They, and in many instances, they, they are, they, some of them will go back uh, in the fight. But when we think about the extraordinary sacrifices that they're making, uh, in defense of this country, I want you to reflect on this. I want you to reflect that that our liberty is being threatened. It's being threatened by this administration. It's being threatened by many of the political class in Washington, D.C., who believe fundamentally that government is, is, is not subservient to us, but that we are servants of government. Uh, they believe um, in 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 unlimited powers of the federal government and not in the constitutional limited government envisioned by our founding fathers. And so, as you come into the 2012 cycle, you need to work hard as if your liberty is being threatened because it is. And I just want to say God bless you, Elbert County Republicans, for all you do uh, for the state of Colorado and, and for this nation and, and for your community. And, uh, and boy, I, we need you. Uh, for 2012, and I know you're going to be there.